we're going to introduce the three speakers we have today shortly but before we do that a little bit of a heads up about what we're talking about today we have previously last week we talked about uh how to work online with video conferencing software and various things so if you want to watch the recordings of that they are about to be released i think i'm just looking at the other team members uh, yeah uh, i just need to finish the subtitles yeah they'll be there and there is a document full of advice from last week this week though we're talking about a slightly different thing we decided um to really think about what makes maths different as a subject particularly when you have to teach it online in terms of the interactivity so for example science outreach in general has a lucky position in that you know there are lots of demos that you can still do as a film if you even if you're not there interacting with it which is obviously great you can still sort of capture the images and mathematics is a is a different beast and any teacher of mathematics which is what i did for 10 years knows that you only really engage with mathematics if you're doing it and it's very hard to make people do mathematics remotely certainly hard to force it um, but there are ways of making online mathematical interactions uh, interactive and that's really the focus of today. So how do we make online talking about maths a more interactive experience? And we have some of the experts who help do that. There are lots of ways to do it and we'll, we'll have an open Q&A session for that. That is the, the theme. Uh, we will have a Q&A with those three speakers and anyone else who wants to pitch in. Um, we've got a couple of other people who are not gonna present, but they're gonna be part of the Q&A to answer questions about what they do. Uh, that's the, the plan for today. We'll see how long it lasts. The um, what we would ask is that as with all of these meetings, there is a code of conduct. Um, if the, uh, you will have seen that if you followed the link from the website here, the TMIP code of conduct is available there. Um, but in summary, uh, please be welcoming, polite, considerate, respectful, use gender neutral language, listen to people and be nice. Uh, there are things here being shared. Um, don't, uh, don't share things that you think are inappropriate. This is also being recorded. And if you're uncomfortable with saying anything that is going to be recorded, then feel free to say it in the chat or in a private message to one of the organizers, and then it won't be public on the recording. Um, I hope that's okay with everybody. If you have any questions about that sort of thing, feel free to get in touch with us uh, off the record, either after this call or in email or whatever. Um, so I think without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Katie to introduce our speakers on the theme of keeping math interactive in the online world. So Katie, can you take over with our intros? Yeah, cool. So um, we have three main speakers who are going to each uh, chat a little bit about themselves and what they do and what's relevant to this topic. Uh, after all three speakers, there'll be a chance uh, for Q&A as well. So if you have got any questions, just make a note of them and we can ask them afterwards, either in the chat or on video. Um, so our first speaker is... Uh, I've could have, could have prepared something for this, uh, but is someone who has uh, spent an incredible amount of his own time uh, building and developing an interactive maths website, which is genuinely quite fantastic. Um, and uh, it's kind of evolved into a larger project. I'm now also involved in it a little bit as well. Um, and uh, Philip is here to tell us a little bit about Mathagon. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that, Katie. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Philip. I work on Mathigon, which is an interactive website for um, uh, learning about mathematics. It contains some content that's aligned to the GCSE and A-level curriculum, but also lots of content that's more uh, outreach and recre recreational mathematics. And like Ben sort of mentioned at the beginning, the, the best way to learn about mathematics is to do it yourself. And um, there are lots of problem solving activities students can do. There are some really amazing videos on YouTube um, or other platforms. And, and there are some, uh, some projects that actually have physical manipulatives for students to play around with in real life and, uh, and games and so on. But of course, we can't do that at the moment. Um, so, so we need to use sort of digital versions of that. But unlike things like chemistry or physics, where everything has to kind of be physical. Of course, you can make videos of explosions and reactions, but uh, it's maybe not quite the same as actually being in the science museum or something like that. In mathematics, there are quite a few things that can be done better digit um, digitally than they can be just on pencil uh, and paper or, um, or uh, a blackboard, just because of the existing dynamic uh, environments we have. And one thing that's really important to remember is that you don't need to be a software developer or programmer in order to be able to create these interactive experiences. There are lots of platforms like GeoGebra or Desmos or Autograph that are freely available and that really allow anyone to create um, interactive 
games, puzzles, uh, activities, and so on for students. Um, and I thought I would start uh, um, by showing you a little bit um, of what Mathigon is, some of my favorite activities um, and stories there. Uh, one of the, or there are two key underlying principles. Um, one is we want to make the content as engaging as possible for students. So there's always a story or some background or, or context so that students don't just learn because they need to write an exam, they learn because there's an interesting problem they can solve with it. And, and the second goal is to make it as interactive as possible. So you don't just listen to a teacher and try to memorize procedures, but students can actually discover some patterns um, themselves. So I'll just share my screen. Let's see if you can uh, see this. Uh, so this is the Mathigon website. Um, all of the content is freely available. Feel free to go there and have a look around. Um, if you go to the activities tab at the top, you can see a few um, of the, the different uh, games and, and puzzles and so on we have um, here. And I've opened a few uh, in different tabs uh, to go through. So one is called uh, Polypad. It's a library of virtual manipulatives and it's used by, uh, by tens of thousands of teachers um, around the world. So you can uh, build uh, tessellations. Um, it's pretty smart with how it handles snapping and rotations and so on. Um, that you can uh, create anything you want really. Number tiles, um, you can sort of show different factorizations of numbers by, by resizing these and you can combine uh, multiple ones and so on. Fractions, bars, algebra tiles and so on. Uh, lots of different uh, virtual versions of physical manipulatives you might have in a classroom. Uh, we've got a timeline of mathematics if you're interested in, uh, in history of science and so on. So you can just scroll through here and uh, see some of the uh, most important mathematicians throughout history from all around the world. Um, we've particularly tried to add lots of uh, female and non-European mathematicians where possible and then we've got short biographies for each of them and then links to interesting courses about topics they worked on. Uh, Factors is a game we built together with MEI um, and uh, it's for slightly younger students maybe it's about factorizing. So you all know Tetris, obviously. Um, here you also have blocks falling down and you can move them left, right and down, but you can't rotate them. Instead, you can change a factorization like this. So if you click the up key, um, in this case, six changed uh, or eight can change, can be one times eight or two times four or four times two or eight times one. So you can um, change the shape of these rectangles. You can't go back. So you have to be careful and think about uh, what the factors are of, um, of a number to do this. And then like in Tetris, you, you build these rows and you get extra points if you clear lots of rows at the same time. In fact, you get exponentially more points for every additional row you clear at once. So the, the best way to try to do it is fill the entire grid and then you're guaranteed a 16 by one block coming down in the last column to clear all of the rows at once. Although that takes a lot of work, but you can do sort of high score of over 60 million that some people have reached. Um, and then in addition to all these activities, we've got lots of courses um, on Mathigon that are um, directly student facing and, and teach interesting topics in mathematics. And for all of them, idea, the idea is um, the content is revealed progressively in small steps um, as you interact. So in this case, I have to solve uh, this, um, this problem. And once I do a little bit more content is revealed. Um, there's a building glossary, there are um, blanks in the text you sometimes have to fill in, uh, and it adapts the upcoming content further down the page depending on how well and how quickly you answer questions previously to have a slightly different um, uh, experience for every student. And all of the diagrams are interactive and sort of allow you to play around. One of my favorite courses is about, is about uh, graph theory. We've got this uh, Königsberg bridges puzzle and students can actually play around with it, uh, see how many bridges they cross, uh, they can cross or um, obviously you can only cross every bridge once. So uh, this map might not be possible, but there are different ones to play around with. And again, rather than telling students the solution to a problem or the proof to a theorem, the goal is to let students to play around and come up with these solutions um, and ideas themselves. You can uh, play the Monty Hall problem a couple of times and see if you find any patterns or let's say I want to swap doors uh, and open the doors and I 
uh, I've got a car. Um, we've got uh, a lot of content about uh, transformations and symmetry and students can draw different patterns in different symmetry groups uh, and then download them as images or make t-shirts out of them, uh, uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, Fibonacci numbers, uh, obviously starting with rabbit populations like this, uh, then uh, some history, some places where they appear in nature and students can uh, try to distribute the seeds of sunflower and find the, the perfect uh, arrangement, which is the golden ratio. And the last course we published is about fractals. Um, and again, lots of different interactive elements here. Um, one really cool one is the chaos game, which you might know. So um, you start with vertices of a polygon, you pick a um, random point um, in this rectangle, and then you um, recursively um, Actually, we've got a version of it here. I pick a point somewhere. I connect it to one of the three vertices of the triangle in this case um, and mark the midpoint. Then I pick a new vertex and mark the midpoint. And I keep marking midpoints and I can do this thousands of times. And in this case, you get the Sierpinski triangle. But if I reset this, so we could start with the vertices of a square. And now if we do this, um, we get a sort of uniform distribution of dots, uh, which is not particularly interesting. But rather than marking the midpoint of these lines, we could pick a different ratio, like two thirds, for example. And in this case, we get uh, slightly different fractals. Or we can also include the midpoint of the edges, and then we get a sort of a two, di two dimensional uh, Sierpinski carpet. Or we can use a pentagon and the Gooden ratio and include the center of the polygon. And then we get these uh, fractal snowflakes and stars. Um, yeah, some stuff about the Mandelbrot set. Uh, students can create their own uh, uh, Julia sets like this and then discover w what they are, uh, how they work, and so on. Um, yeah, so this is just a um, quick overview. I think um, in the q and I, I wasn't sure what would be most interesting for you, whether it's ideas for interactive elements to use in workshops or webinars um, or, or online classes you run, or whether you're more interested in the technical aspects, how, how you can make some of these. So uh, if, if you post some questions in, um, uh, in the chat, I can hopefully try to answer all of them. Thank you very much, Philip. Yeah, I think we can definitely let the, the Q&A steer uh, that kind of discussion and, and which way we go with that, but that's a fantastic introduction. Um, so carrying on from that, with uh, possibly a slight amount of overlap. Yes, Kevin's right. So if you go down to reactions at the bottom, there is a clap reaction, which you are very much welcome to use at this stage. Uh, if you're on the uh, gallery view and you can see everyone, you'll be able to see all the clapping coming up uh, all over the screen, which is quite, quite a nice reassuring thing to see. Uh, thank you very much to, to Philip. Um, so yeah, kind of following on from that and possibly slightly overlapping, but going on to other things as well. Um, we've invited uh, Christian Lawson Perfect, who is, uh, who works at the University of Newcastle and uh, in there in particular working on e-assessment, so looking at online uh, and or computerised assessments that are used within universities, but in his spare time, uh, which it's amazing that he somehow has, uh, Christian also writes for a website called The A Periodical with me, does various other things on uh, the internet and produces his own kind of online interactive things uh, as well. So we've invited him to come and say a little bit about uh, some of the e-assessment stuff and then a little bit about uh, the things that he's built himself uh, and how people interact with them. Uh, so thank you, Christian. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for in inviting me to do this. Um, so at the moment, um, because my day job is in e-assessment, um, I'm extremely busy preparing for a ton of exams that were due to happen on paper. Um, so I haven't had a lot of time to think about this. Um, I think what I'd like to do is um, give uh, sort of a view of different kinds of uh, ways you can get a computer to do uh, math stuff um, uh, interactively or not. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show some stuff. Um, so here we go. Um, so this is what I do for my day job. Um, I make a system called Numbers, which does um, e-assessment of uh, maths and a load of other subjects. Um, and the idea is that um, you show the student a question that's been randomly generated by the computer and you take an answer from them. Um, and it marks it, gives them some feedback. Um, and this is important in higher ed because we have to assess them all the time. Um, 
but um, as well as just using it for homework and exams, um, we think it's really useful to have computers um, to give students practice at stuff. Having a, um, a tool that you can use to get feedback on um, stuff you're doing uh, is really useful for learning. Um, so that's what I do during the day. Um, and I, I, I've given so many talks about this that I don't want to do it for this. Um, this is a maths uh, outreach kind of thing, so I want to talk about other stuff. Um, so um, what I want to say is, um, uh, oh, I've got my things in the wrong order. Um, so you want to use a computer to um, do some interactive maths. Um, there are a few different ways you could use it. Um, one thing you could do is you could just use the computer to sh show you something. Um, so here I've, I've set up a website, um, 3.14159.com, which shows you pi. Um, I mean, you could print this, that would be absolutely mad, um, but you couldn't really print it because it's infinite. Um, what this website does is it shows you the digits of pi. And if I scroll down slowly enough for the video sharing to keep up, um, it will just keep going. Um, so what's interesting here is that um, you can keep generating digits of pi. Um, there's nothing for me to do with this page other than just keep scrolling down. Um, I'm not being assessed on anything as, as very little interactivity. Um, but this is uh, something I refer back to quite a lot because it can provoke uh, mathematical questions. Um, or you could just use it as a reference for the digits of pi if you know the first <laughs> six. Um, so that's one thing you do. That's, that's, basically no interactivity. Um, you could use the computer as a calculator, as a tool to do something that would be too hard to do on paper or in your head. Um, so we can have uh, kind of a, a calculator. Actually, uh, what, have I, what else have I got? I've got another thing here. This one lists uh, the reciprocals of numbers. Um, I wrote this because, did you know that 1 over 17 uh, repeats every 16 digits? 1 over 7 repeats every 6. There's some questions you could have about that. Um, so the next thing up you could do uh, is use the computer to do stuff for you. So you give it a number uh, and it does something with it. Um, so one of my websites is, is this prime.com, which I use surprisingly often. Um, so you can put in a number and it will tell you if it's prime or not. Um, and you can put in a really, really big number. Um, I mean, can see my Aldi orders there in my recent history. Uh, so that's not a prime number, I reckon. How far do I have to go until I get a prime? Um, what this is doing is, hey, there we go. <laughs> um, what this is doing is uh, applying some um, probable prime tests um, to check whether a number uh, is prime or not. Um, you would never be able to do that in your head. Um, so this, we're sort of ramping up the interactivity. You can give this a number and it will tell you if it's prime or not. Um, the presentation of this is really important, um, I think. It could be a sort of form that you type in a number and you click OK and it comes back and shows you yes prime or not. Um, the way this is set up, you go to the site and you've got these arrows to go back and forth between numbers and you can go to a particular number by just typing it in the address bar, um, which makes it very easy to use. Um, I didn't look at what time I started, by the way. I don't know how long I've got. Um, this is something I made for James Grine. Um, he does a demo about humming codes. And the idea is um, you have this grid of digits, of binary digits, and you can spot an error. Um, and, oh, that's the cell I uh, changed. So you can turn on some things. Um, and the, the way you spot the error is by adding up the rows and the columns um, and working out the one that's got the wrong parity. Um, so this is quite simple uh, algorithmically, but doing it all on paper or on a, a whiteboard was just too tricky. Um, so this is something that uh, makes it easy to uh, demonstrate how this, uh, this algorithm works. Um, right. Again, slowly ramping up the interactivity. Um, here's something, um, I'm not even going to try to explain the maths behind it, but I picked it because it's something where you, you get uh, some simulation and you get some controls. 
Um, so again, I'm not being asked to do any maths here, but I can, um, this might solve this Sudoku, by the way. Nearly. Yeah. Close enough. It will eventually solve the Sudoku. Um, <laughs> go on, you can do it. No. Um, so again, this is something that you could never do on paper. Um, it's doing millions of calculations. Um, um, and it demonstrates the maths behind um, a particular dynamical system that uh, is uh, discovered. Um, right. Next thing, here's something that um, is quite topical. Um, uh, so Mike Bloomberg, no, was it Mike Bloomberg? Yeah, spent a load of money trying to be president. Um, and then these people on the news said that was enough to give everybody in America a million dollars because they divided 500 million by 300 million or something um, and got over a million. Um, what this does is I got a load of data um, and said with a given amount of money, how much could you give to everybody in America? Um, so I can say if I've got roughly a billion dollars, I could give one dollar to everyone in the state, United States, ten dollars to everyone in California. Um, so based on population data for different cities and states, um, I can do that calculation, which sort of answers a it's kind of a core maths question. Um, and I'm using the computer to do all these calculations very quickly that um, I would never be able to do. Um, finally, what you could uh, do, ah, do I want to show these things? No. Um, uh, Philip showed quite a lot of uh, interactive stuff where um, there's, a, there's a back and forth where um, you will, uh, uh, the computer will show you something, you have to do it and it will give you um, feedback on that. Um, and that's what the e-assessment stuff does. It gives you a question, you enter an answer, it gives you feedback. Um, here is a uh, game which Ben was desperate for me to show. <laughs> um, so based on the, the is this prime site, I thought, why don't you turn it around and say rather than me going to the computer and the computer tells me if a number is prime, the computer is going to ask me if these numbers are prime. Um, and then you really have to think about how you decide um, whether a number is prime or not. Um, so what it does is it gives you a number and you have to say yes or no. Um, in real life, if we're all in the same place, I would be getting you all to shout out uh, if it's prime or not. I'm going to keep pressing yes. Oh, there we go. Um, so that is, I think, um, in the abstract sense, I'm talking about these things. Um, sort of the, the most interactive you could be. Um, you could, uh, the idea is that having a computer prompt you to do something and then you do it and it gives you feedback. Um, but all of these different ways of doing stuff are worthwhile. Um, I think uh, making something that just shows you some maths can still provoke as much mathematical activity as um, guiding somebody through either having a game or um, some more classic um, assessment stuff. Um, so I think uh, I'll stop sharing my screen there. Um, on the uh, note of how I make these things, I make lots of stuff on the web. Um, I think that's the right way to do stuff for people to see it very easily. Um, I use JavaScript and HTML and stuff because I do a load of coding for my normal job, but you can do these sorts of things. Um, as Philip said, in, in GeoGebra and Desmos, it's quite easy to make stuff that's a bit interactive. Um, and I think that's all I've got to say. Cool, fantastic. Um, so yeah, and I think, it's, I mean, at the, at the minute we're thinking about things that are delivered entirely online because that's all that's happening at the moment, but I suspect that um, you know, there'll be a lot of people here who do kind of in-person workshops and things that might be able to use some of that kind of thing. Like you're saying, James uses the uh, the thing that you've built in, like he uses that on stage in, in real workshops, but you could also maybe get people to interact with that while they're at home and you're on a video or something like that uh, in the same kind of way. And I've certainly got a little bit of that planned for some of the science festivals that I'm doing this summer as well. 
Um, so again, if anyone has any questions for Christian, stick them into the chat. If there's any questions, if you're interested in hearing more about the e-assessment side of things, uh, I'm sure it can be uh, arm twisted into talking a little bit about that as well. Um, but I think uh, we'll move on to our third speaker. So um, I guess the, the discussion so far has been about kind of things that you interact with in a, a website kind of context, but there are other ways to make things interactive as well. Uh, and this was something that we definitely wanted to include as part of this session. So if anyone's familiar with the I'm a Scientist project, um, this is a, a project in which uh, students can send in questions to real live actual scientists. They also have, I'm a mathematician and I'm an engineer. Um, and we've invited uh, Michaela, who is uh, one of the events managers uh, for I'm a Scientist. So organizes the event, gets the, the speakers, gets the, the kids asking questions, uh, managing the day-to-day -day running of the thing, training people, training moderators and recruiting schools and getting people involved. So um, we've brought in Michaela to talk a little bit about how that kind of interaction um, I guess it's it's a different form of interaction to someone sitting at home using a website, um, but I think it's probably also something that's definitely worth considering building into the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, so, Michaela. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. And thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I was just putting the links to the websites if you want to have a look. But I'm a scientist. Um, has been running things since I think about 2007. I don't know if anyone here has taken part before. Uh, we also run, as Katie said, I'm an engineer, I'm a mathematician, um, and we also kind of run on a global scale as well. So just uh, we're kicking off a project in Germany in September, we're running in Spain soon, uh, we're running in Kenya. So yeah, we're, we're, but we're relatively a small company um, who do quite big, large scale uh, engagement activities for schools, and they're all online. Uh, so the idea is for school students to connect with people in STEM careers. Uh, we kind of use scientists as a catch-all um, for all the STEM professionals. So sorry if I say stat scientists, but it can be kind of, we have mathematicians taking part, we have engineers, we have geologists, we have, you know, a, covers a huge range of people. Um, our main events run for schools three times a year, uh, but we also run kind of one-off things or um, things at different points of the year depending on which funders we're working with um, but we basically it's kind of a scalable model so we'd have a lot of schools taking part at one point and a lot of scientists taking part at the same time um, we're running I'm a scientist we've sort of rebranded to call ourselves I'm a scientist stay at home during the school closures so that's happening now uh, we've had sort of over 2,000 students log into the site so far since the closures so it's been it's been really good that we can still kind of run the activities even though students aren't in schools. So the way it works, um, I'll share my screen with you so I can show you the website. So this is uh, the I'm a mathematician site. So we ran this for the first time in January. Uh, Sam took part um, as one of the mathematicians and this was with the Royal Institution uh, to go with their Christmas lectures. So basically what happens is scientists fill out profiles or mathematicians fill out profiles on the website about themselves, about their jobs. Um, I've actually got sounds up here to show you. So we, <laughs> we ask them to give kind of a brief introduction to themselves. They kind of talk about their education, their background. It's really important for us that students see that not every scientist or mathematician went to a private school, not everyone went to a top university, not everybody got all A stars in their GCSEs, you know, there's, you don't have to be the smartest student in the class to, to go into a STEM career. But something that's also really important, which is what Sam's written about here and her about me section, is hobbies and interests and things to make students relate to uh, the people taking part, not just about what you do as a mathematician it's also about who you are as a person and making sure that students can see there's they have things in common it's, it could be a job for someone like them whereas maybe they haven't really thought that before if they don't know any STEM, it's an opportunity for them to use them so students can log in from the classroom or they can log in from home as they are at the moment. They can send questions uh, through the site. So about anything they want to do with 
the theme of the of the zone that they're in or to do with you know personal things um favorite foods anything they like they also take part in live chat sessions so that's a time where a teacher can book uh i'll, I'll show you an example in, in a second um so this is the mm, there we go. The medical research zone, which we're running as part of the stay-at-home um, activity, and I think you should be able to see a chat happening. Here you go. So this is what the live chat looks like. So on the left, you have students. You can see there's three minutes left, so um, there's still a few a few minutes for you to have a look. The students can ask questions, and um, on the right-hand side, we've got scientists giving their answers um, so we have I guess it might be useful to know kind of how we manage the, the live chat so you can see Mod Mia here we have a team of moderators who work with us and they um, they're all DBS checked we give them safeguarding training and their job is basically then to make sure that the chats run smoothly uh, but the, uh, the main idea is that they're student-led, so we don't tell the students what to ask, we don't tell the scientists what to talk about, um, it totally depends on what the students want to know. I'm trying to, I'll scroll up a bit and see some of the questions. So you can see they're talking about the Martian film, why is there a push for MPs on a bank of coronated chickens, so it's really open for students to find out things that they want and then we, we base this around, I don't know if you've heard of the science capital teaching, but the idea is that if students can find things they can relate to and things that they find interesting, then they're more likely to see STEM and STEM careers as something for them. Um, I don't know, Sam, if it might be useful if you talked a bit about the scientist side or the mathematician side of things, of how you found the chats. Um, yeah, so I found it really interesting to be part of the event. So um, the I'm a mathematician one we ran in January was in conjunction with the Christmas lectures on maths. So I sort of joined it as I'm not a research mathematician. I'm a maths communicator and I'm sort of was in the organization that did the lectures, but I wasn't directly involved. So you get some questions, particularly on, there was question boards as well as the live discussions about how stuff worked in the lectures. Um, but you'd also get lots of, of maths type questions that you can answer and, and things like that. In the live chats, there was always some really random questions and there were some really interesting ones that I found really fascinating to sort of think about and stuff like that. Um, so one of the things they asked you in the profile was, if you weren't doing this job, what would you be doing? And I put down that I'd probably be running a bookshop or something like that because I, something that I'd, I'd probably really enjoy doing. And then I got loads of questions like, oh, what would you call your bookshop? And I was thinking, oh, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't thought about this in that great a detail yet. It was just, just a question that I answered. Um, you also, also, you always got ones about how much you earn and things like that, the things that the kids are interested in. But I found the, the quality of the chat really differed depending on the students that were taking part. Some mm. groups were really, really fascinating, really insightful, asking lots of interesting questions. Some of them got really into the, the mathsy type questions and some of them were more sort of personal type and there was a good mix there. And some, it was like pulling teeth. It was really hard to get anything out of them except stupid comments. Um, but mostly, it was really, really interesting. The thing I and my colleague, who was also involved, both found quite quite difficult was the, the sheer volume of questions. You've got a mm. class full of kids, all on there, all asking questions. And they're not waiting for you to answer their friend's question, which might be the same as their question. Um, they're not looking at necessarily what you're saying. They're just asking question after question after question. And we both found it quite tiring um, and quite intense, yeah. but it was really quite worthwhile as well. So, yeah. I totally understand what you mean about all the questions. Something that we have put in place to try and help with that is, I don't know if you can see this number 30 by Emily Ding Dong. Um, that is the number of replies that student has had. So what we try and do if the chat is really, really busy is we get the moderators to ask uh, you guys just to focus on students who maybe have zeros or ones. Um, 
because it can be really hard to sort of prioritize which student to ask because I totally get it when you've got loads of questions coming in. Um, yeah, I don't know how much time is, is left. I didn't even look at the time when I started. Um, yeah, so I think obviously like more than happy to ask answer any other questions about how the activity actually works or I'm not sure what, what's the most interesting part guys but I think just to kind of reiterate if you are doing sort of two-way interaction like this then the most important thing which we found is that you're talking with students you're engaging with them you're not talking to them and finding something in common and some a common ground to start with is always a really good really good way to get them engaged get them interested and then you can then relate that to what you're working on and the things that you're interested in too Cool. Uh, fantastic. So that's, that's kind of, again, a potted intro. I think this is probably quite an extreme version of the sort of, uh, you know, two-way interaction thing, like mm. just literally bombard you with questions. Um, and I suspect there'll be some people who, you know, building Q&A sessions as part of talks that they do and that kind of thing. But um, it kind of gives you a real insight into the, the kind of strengths of that format because the kids can ask what they're interested in that can in some ways inform what you talk about. Uh, and I'd, I'd be really interested to see just a free form Q&A maths talk, <laughs> just like, you know, there's a few kids that have been prepped with questions, but mostly it's just answering whatever they're asking. That would be a really interesting thing to see. Um, yeah. So thank you very much to all three of our speakers. If anyone wants to do applause, reactions, etc., please do. Um, I'll just have a look at the gallery view so I can see everyone there. Oh, it's so wonderful. It's heartwarming. Um, so I think I'm going to hand over to Kevin for Q&A.